Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we're going to paint a really bright and big bouquet of flowers. I took this photo at a restaurant the other day and I thought it was gorgeous. And um, hopefully I can capture it uh, along with the spirit of the day in my painting. And I think that's a, a good thing to do. I started off by sketching it on a large piece of drawing paper and then I transferred that drawing onto my watercolor paper. Now I'm hoping my watercolor paper performs well because it's actually a paper I really like. It's Hannah Mule Expression, um, but I'm a little concerned because um, my daughters have been painting down here and one of my daughters got into my oil paints and even though it, they cleaned up when they were done there was some residue and I got some oil residue I think on on this paper definitely on the back side and I might have got a little on the front side when I was tearing it down so I'm hoping that it doesn't cause a problem when I'm painting if it does I'm gonna work with it because I don't know about you but if I had a big sheet of my favorite watercolor paper and um, it got a little smear on it, I probably would still use it. So, um, you know, so I'm assuming you probably would as well. Um, I'm using my M. Graham watercolors. I love using a big studio palette when I'm painting. Oftentimes I don't use it on camera because it takes up so much space, but since this is such a tall painting, I figured I could, I could, you know, I would have the extra room on my paper. So my brush is sopping wet, and I'm going to start off by getting some different colors to put in the background. Um, I love using ultramarine blue. It has a beautiful texture to it. I have pre-sprayed my palette just because I know I'm going to be using a lot of paints here. And I like to start off with some of my favorite tried and true colors. Um, that would be ultramarine blue. And I've got my water bucket here. Maybe I'll see if I can get that in frame a little bit for you. I've got my water bucket here. I clean my brush on one side and I get fresh water on the other. I'm also going to grab some burnt sienna so I can make a nice neutral color. When I mix it with this, see how that neutralizes? Because that burnt sienna is so orange when you mix it with the ultramarine blue. Those are opposites on the color wheel and they neutralize. I think that makes a really nice uh, nice color to uh, kind of get going with. I'm going to start off, I'm going to just kind of sweep some of that on my paper. I want things to flow and blend. Uh, they are going to go within the lines and that's fine. I'm not going to worry about that. I can refine later. I can add some gouache if I need to. I just want to get some colors in, but I don't really want to have that defined um, window and table and wall. I want to, um, I want to have just more, more or less the kind of color, and I want to have a nice white border. So I taped it down. Now the nice thing about these colors, in addition to them just being such a nice neutral is that they're sedimentary, which means if I get them somewhere, I don't want them. All I have to do is wet my brush and brush over the area and then I can lift it away. So that's another really nice reason to use this. And since I'm doing wet into wet, this is going to be a little lighter when I'm done. So I don't have to, you know, I'm not, these are very melodious or agreeable colors, I would say. They get along. They get along with almost everything. I find that I, I probably use ultramarine blue and burnt sienna in 95% of the paintings, the watercolors I do. And if I'm not using burnt sienna, I'm using a, uh, usually I'm using a burnt umber that's made from the same pigment that looks very similar to burnt sienna. So I am painting around the flowers, but I'm not worrying about them getting into the flower areas. I also want to get some of that color in the vase. I've got kind of a puddle here and I'm going to actually grab a paper towel because my rag, I have, I use that to blot my brush a lot and um, by the way when I paint big like this I kind of have it so I can walk all, all around my table and get on all sides of it. Um, I've got some pretty big puddles down here so I am going to blot those off. I didn't want to blot with that just because in case there was any soap residue or anything on there I didn't want it to get on my painting. The brush I'm using here is number 30 Creative Mark Mimic. I'm using a lot of favorites today. I'm using my favorite brushes for watercolor. I'm using my favorite uh, paints, and I'm using my favorite one of my favorite papers. I love. I I have a thing with paper, so I happen to have probably a few favorites. Oh, I think it'd be nice to have some yellow ochre in here too, because that's also a nice lifting color. Put some of that in here. It's a nice uh, sunny color as well. Get some of this 
And here, this table area. So this is wet into wet. When you hear somebody re refer to wet into wet, this is what they're talking about. This is fluid. It's uh, stuff is kind of mushing around. I think I'll bring that up here a little bit. And something I like to do when I'm doing my backgrounds is I like to get everything in. I try to get as many things in as possible so that I will have uh, I'll have harmony. I like little bursts of light in the vase because you would get that. This is um, just kind of like a, a unifying wash. I'll be putting more layers on top. But you want to try to keep everything at the same level of wetness as you're doing this first wash so you don't end up with puddles and you don't end up with streaks. I'm going to go into the, the bouquet a little bit and start choosing some of the colors I plan on using. I want to use a nice cheerful lemon. This is a cadmium lemon or cadmium uh, pale, cadmium yellow pale. Put that in a couple of these flowers. I like to kind of cross pollinate a little bit. Don't worry about things going in the background. I know it's kind of freaky. You're probably seeing stuff blossom around and it's giving you a little anxiety. No need of that. No need to worry about that. Um, I think I'll use a little bit of mauve. Now these color, this mauve, this is a staining color. So I'll, want to, I'll, I'll try to keep it within reason a little bit. And I'll take that mauve and add some ultramarine blue to it. Let's get a little bit in here. Okay, so now I can actually go in with a smaller brush. And I can... I can guide it around a little bit. This, is, this brush is dry, so it's soaking up excess water. The reason I like to do this is because, personally, I don't like my paintings to look like it's all cut and pasted. And some people do. If you like that crisp, cut and pasted look, then, you know, I, I'd still recommend trying this, because why the heck not? You should try everything, see what suits you and what doesn't. But um, I don't like that cut and pasted look, so for me, doing a technique like this is really... Um, is really nice. I like it. Okay, I'm just gonna tip this. Now I didn't stretch this paper, and I probably should for using 140 pound paper as such a large large size. But um, I'm blotting off some puddles here. But I was impatient. I just wanted to paint. I wanted to play, and um, and so I didn't. So you know, if you've got the time, if you get the inclination, go ahead and stretch your paper. I'm going to go with a bit of a smaller brush. I'm going to grab some, let's do some Cad Red, either Cad Red Light or Cad Red Medium. This is a sedimentary color. This will lift up just fine. Now since my, um, I got that paint on there pretty thickly, is just bursting off of my brush. I love what it's doing there. It's going a little, um, a little crazy as it hits some puddles, so I think I will blot up some of that excess. But I like, I like that kind of fiery effect that's having, and I want to do that up here, too. I like that. It's almost going to get, give it like a parrot tulip kind of, kind of effect. Now, one of the reasons I don't mind the color spreading is that this picture is taken in front of a window. This is actually a window into the kitchen at the restaurant that I was at, but I figured if it hit some reflections, that would be fine. I could have it like kind of in front of a mirror and that would just be kind of an interesting, um, an interesting vantage point. I'm gonna go back to that cad light, cad yellow light, mix it in with the red and get some oranges. And put that in this peony, or maybe it's actually, it's, I think it's a tulip. It's too early for peonies. I love seeing fresh flowers. Oh, they were so pretty too. Okay, now I'm going to go back with some more purple, uh, less watery. We'll let the water on the palette grab that purple, that uh, ultramarine blue and mauve. See, if you have a, if you have drier paint, 
you can control it even on like a super wet surface like I have here. This is cotton paper. That's a kind of an important thing. Um, with cotton paper, you're going to have a lot more ability to play. You're going to have more open working time. Cellulose paper dries a little bit less predictably. You're, you, could have a, you could have a patch completely dry, and you could have a puddle right next to it. And that's why you get more blooms when you're working with a cotton paper. You can also do this on Yupo and have an absolutely opposite effect. You would have... Um, you'd have all kinds of blooms and hard edges and interesting things happening and that is totally fine do whatever you want to do now i want to put some green in the vase but i definitely want to make sure it doesn't flow outside of the vase so i'm going to concentrate it to the center i'm going to use a permanent green light so i am using more colors than i typically would use because um the spirit of this piece is very spring and very vibrant i don't mind if any of the green goes anywhere within the vase because you do get interesting refractions and whatnot when you are looking at glass I just don't want I don't want to be on the outside of the vase because that wouldn't make any sense as far as as far as uh, as far as painting but again if I'm thinking about maybe this instead of being in front of a mirror uh, window it's in front of a mirror I like the idea of there being some color just kind of doing its thing and flowing and, and filling and reflecting. I love reflecting colors. I think that's why I like to paint um, glass so much and I like to paint water. There's something very interesting about the way light and color reflects for me. So the key when you're doing a wet and to wet background like I'm doing here is to is to get it down fairly quickly and then leave it alone because once once it starts to dry on you you're gonna you're gonna um, you really run the risk of getting streaky hard edges and overworking it and honestly if you can go if you can leave the room and do something else that's your best bet because you're going to be so tempted if you're anything like me you're going to be so tempted to just well i'm just going to like do a little no you don't want to do a little no do any of that little bit here and there i'm taking a little sap green or hooker's green whatever you like and i want to add some of that in there too because i just love a good sap green and like i mentioned before i want to integrate all these colors in i'll list them for you in the video description if you don't have the same color as i do just, I have a, a cheat sheet over on my blog where I have substitutions. Just substitute it. Use what you have um, and have fun. This may not be the style that suits you. This may be a complete experimentation for you. But um, but I think it's really worthwhile and I think you'll have a lot of fun doing it. So we're going to let this dry and then when we come back we'll do our next layer. The next thing I want to do, now this is all dry, is to define around the vase. I'm going to use a little bit of masking tape because I do have this little bit of wall that I decided I do want to define a little bit. So masking is just going to give me the uh, the easiest way to block this off, and it'll give me an interesting um, kind of band of color. I don't think it's going to I don't think it's going to divide up my space as much as it's just going to give me an interesting uh, kind of pattern in the background. I want to make sure I press that down well so that I get a good. Uh, line and then I'm actually going to take some of that cad red light that I had used earlier and I'm going to take a little bit of burnt sienna Ooh. let's clean that up I get a lot of cad red in that burnt sienna here And what I want to do is mix up enough color that I can um, that I can just kind of paint it wet on dry and add some shadow into it as well. A little more cad red here. And a little bit of ultramarine blue. That's going to go more in the shadowy areas, which there isn't a lot of. But I do want to have a little bit of shadow behind the vase. Just a little bit of toning there. So I'll actually start right up next to the vase with that color. I'm hoping I sketched it on pretty symmetrically. That's why I drew it on another piece of paper because I was worried that if I um, 
if I freehanded it on my good paper that I would have eraser marks and stuff. Oh, I want that a little bit more saturated, so I'm just going in there. A little more burnt, uh, a little bit more ultramarine blue. I'm gonna blot off that extra. Clean up the pan a little bit. Now you can mess with this. Oh shoot! I didn't mean to go over that that branch. I don't know if I can lift that out. Not branch. I didn't mean to go over that petal, but I might be able to res rescue it there. Sometimes it's hard to talk and paint at the same time. You get your um, your thoughts get kind of divided as you're doing that. And I did get into the, the vase a little bit there, but I think it would be, I would be more likely to mess it up if I went in and tried to correct it than if I just left it be. It's almost like I'm pre-wetting my paper with the paint and then I can go back in and put more paint in if I need to. Which I will. Always clean your brush in this dirty water, then go to the clean water. Out of these three colors, a cad red is the strongest. Ultramarine blue and cadmium red also make a really nice um, dark because that cad red light is so orangey that the blue automatically neutralizes it. Just make sure you don't have any puddles and you should be good. When you're done, you want to make sure that everything is even wetness so that you don't end up with hard edges. I think that's going to be all right. Actually, it would kind of look a little bit more blue on that side. Hopefully the glare's not too bad for you. I do like to let the color do some mixing on the paper. That's why I'm kind of putting the blue in mostly on its own because I just think it gives it a very lively, interesting look versus mixing everything out on your uh, palette first. Now you might have to actually wash your brush with some mild soap and water when you've been using really heavy colors like this just to get the excess out, especially if you're doing a big painting. I find sometimes after a large painting I do need to wash my colors. I'm kind of wondering if I could just peel this. Now I'm going to let that dry. It's a bad idea to to peel it off while it's wet, but while it's drying I can work on other parts of the painting. I think I'm going to go ahead and work up here at the top of the painting a bit. And I might actually at a few points go to the other side of the table. I'm going to zoom in. And I think I will start on that flower, which is right there. And I'm going to use a round brush. I'm going to use a number six, oh, number eight Princeton Neptune. I've got some cad yellow light and a little bit of that red, the cad red. And I'm going to go in and put some nice painterly strokes in here. Hopefully my arm isn't blocking your sight. These colors, uh, your cadmium colors, are always going to be a little bit more opaque. So 
This is almost gouache-like because of the properties of the, um, the cadmium yellow. Not going to be quite as opaque as gouache, but definitely similar. And I like, I kind of like that for this. I think I'll just fill in the whole petal back there. I like leaving those uh, expressive brush, stro brush strokes because everything is just so modeled from underneath and I think it's nice if you can have some defined brush strokes in amongst those kind of modeled ones that have kind of faded, faded away. Trying not to set my hand in the wet paint that we just did. We'll do a little bit in here. No, it might not. I mean, that might be how I leave that that flower. I like the way it looks. So, for right now, I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna grab a little bit of this green here with my dirty brush. Grab some of that. Just bring some of that yellow over. I try to mix from what I have as much as possible. Give some definition into the leaves on this flower. I can dry brush to give a little veining. And we can get some of the stems in for these guys. Get some crisp lines in there. I feel like if you put a nice background in, um, it takes a lot of the work out because you've established, it's kind of like if you're working on like pastel or you're working in gouache and you're working on a toned background because that's already taken so much of the work out because we've toned that background. We've, you know, the viewer can make up their mind and the viewer can add to that. You know, the viewer can see a hint of something and realize, oh, okay. I'm looking at this or I'm looking at that. I throw a few stems in there while I'm at it. Oh, you know what? I probably ought to wait because if I do that, then I'm going to have them starting and stopping, and I don't want that. I could use my heat tool to dry this, but I taped this down to my cutting mat. I should have, like, not been lazy and grabbed my painting board from upstairs because, um, because that way I would be able to, you know, heat it, dry it with a heat tool, and not worry about warping it. Can go in and add any of the little grasses that I painted in before that I kept loose. I don't want to do this one because that's got that tape in there. If you're going around something, keep the shape that you're painting around in mind. So like I'm doing a little negative painting here as I'm going around that flower right there. I'm going to fatten up that too a little bit, I think. So when you've got a bunch of different things like that, it's not only just what you're painting, it's what what is around what you're painting as well. I think I'm going to add another little leaf in there too. This is a Princeton Neptune brush. I like those quite a bit as well. I prefer the Creative Mark um, Mimics, but they are a little harder to find if you're not in the United States. So probably shouldn't have painted right next to that stem. I don't know if it's dry or not. I'm approaching this in what I call an intuitive style. That's kind of when you're, you know, I'm loosely going from my reference photo, but I'm doing a lot of just kind of painting what I think I want there, you know, versus what's actually there. 
sometimes it goes really well. Other times it doesn't. You know, it's kind of a, you know, when you're doing a little less planning, it's a little bit more of a gamble. But um, sometimes you get something that's really awesome. So I recommend trying it now and again. kind of taking some of those shapes that you made when you were doing the wet and to wet background and giving them a little more form. Go back to the yellow mix and add a few more stems in. Make sure they're connected to the flower they need to be connected to. And I don't have flower heads just floating in the air. And it gives it a nice sharpness when you go over them. Don't worry if um, your original wash, your paint didn't go up to the, the quite the bottom of the flower. That's where you fix it at this point. And don't worry if you have, you know, flower colors in your background. That's part of the, uh, that's part of what we want. So a lot of times I will just kind of like hover my brush in the air and I will kind of connect the lines that way to make sure that my stems are lining up with the flowers they should be connected to. And that just keeps your painting from looking really off. I really like the way that looks. I don't think I'm gonna do a heck of a lot more to that flower. I may add just little, a few little touches of the um, blush. I should have blotted that before I picked up color. I may just add a few little touches of lemon. But you know, I really like that. It's just kind of fresh. I like it. All right, now this guy here, I didn't really, it, it was a white flower, um, so I can either add more greens to it, I could add some mauve to it. Um, I think I might do greens just because there's, I have yellow underneath, if I did the mauve on top, then I think it would get a little, um, I think it would just get a little too, like, muddy. So I'm just going to go in, I'm still using that number eight. Neptune and I'm putting green shadows in so I'm finding like the top edge of these petals and I'm going in behind them like the petal that's getting underlapped and just adding a little bit of that green uh, I'm gonna blot my brush I'm just gonna grab a little bit of water a little lemon And I'm just going to throw in a little bit of edging there. Just to define it because I had it so, um, it just kind of mushed into the background. Now what I can do because I'm getting this toning down here is I can use some white gouache later and I can highlight those petals and give it that freshness of like, you know, sometimes you have those white flowers have a little bit of green on them. It's real pretty. So I'll be able to do that. Now on this guy, I want to have some more of the orange. I'm going to mix up some fresh color. Move my palette so you can see. Clean that brush out. Let's see. Yeah, you can see that. And grab a little bit of yellow, a little bit of that cad red in there. I'm going to do the darker orange here towards the outside. I'm using my brush straight up and down and I'm just kind of like I did with that that tulip up there or whatever that is I'm doing just kind of little curvy uh, strokes but I'm leaving them very defined and then I'm going to go in with some yellow cleaner brush the yellow that has it does have a little bit of red into it I 
if they mix and mingle, I'm not going to worry about it. I can always go and define it more later, so... But I want the motion of those strokes to go in that circular... That circular way. I want to get a little bit of dark in the center. Get a bunch of packed petals. And maybe we'll just grab some lemon on its own. It's almost fluorescent. It's so bright. Cad yellow lemon or cad yellow light. Such a great color. I'm going to need to define that one a little bit more, but it's fine for now. Um, I can also take any of the colors that I've used and add a little bit into the vase if I want to. Okay, what flower do I want to work on next? I think I'll go to this one, but in, in, I want to change it, I think, from what I have here because I have so many yellow flowers. I, I like how that looks kind of like a strawberry and cream tulip, and I want to, uh, I think I want to keep it like that. So I'm just going to use the Cad Red light on its own. Blot my brush a little bit. Actually, I might even add a smidge and a mauve in there to cool that color down a little bit. Let's see. I turned my palette around, so now I'm a little confused. And... I want to keep what I have without messing it up too much. I really like what's like happening in here. I think that's really, uh, really accurate to those types of flowers. So I just want to put in just a few defining marks. Using the tip of the brush. If you want more expressive strokes, hold it towards the end and then you won't be, um, you won't fuss with it so much. I think I'm going to turn this into a, like a petal that's kind of opened up a little bit more. I might go in with a little bit of white later. For those really bright really bright white streaks. And that's going to be totally fine because we're using so many cadmiums in this in this painting we're going to have a we're going to have a, just a bit of opacity anyway. So I'm not going to worry about about oh no, I'm adding opaque color because you know, some of these watercolors are going to be more opaque anyway, just because I'm using cadmiums. And I think when you're painting intuitively, you know, you're, you're going to use what your gut tells you to use. I don't like the shape of that. I want to round it. I'm going to go over that petal. I was going to try to go around it, but it doesn't make sense. I wouldn't have that growing through that flower, so... It's funny how cool that color looks. I'm wondering if I grabbed the wrong... I wonder if I might have grabbed two different reds. Although that looks nice and... That looks so bright there, but it looks kind of dull when I have it... When I have it up there on that flower. I'm pretty sure I only grabbed the one red, though. Review the footage. You can review the footage. I'm just going to keep plugging along with this. Thought it might be fun to do this flower here with a wedge brush because it's got a lot of tiny little puddles that I think might be kind of kind of fun to just get that kind of that kind of shape. So I'm just gonna load the brush up with just some watery purple paint that I have on my palette. I'm gonna pick up the darker purple on the tip of my brush, and I am just going to kind of stab and wiggle my brush in there. get some of those shapes. I'm going to load it up again. Add a little more water to that. This is a number six best, uh, I think it's number six, nope, number eight best wedge brush. That's the brand name B-E-S-T-E. -E. A 
does such a nice job at giving you this like fluffy, fluffy, jagged flower. And I have a whole section on using the wedge brush in my watercolor floral workshop. If you want to check that out, I will link it below along with a coupon code for my friends, for you guys. You can save some money on it. It's one of my best selling classes and it is so much fun. It teaches you how to paint flowers intuitively and uh, learn some basic brush strokes so that you can get the most out of your supplies and show you how to arrange bouquets and um, wreaths and arrangements. So, you know, you can just sit down kind of with your watercolors and almost like doodle with them. Especially with summer coming up, it's so nice to like sit outside and just paint flowers. Okay, I like that shape. I think that's kind of fun. I think I'll go to that red flower up top. It's like a, it looks like a tulip. I'm going to just go right in with the CAD Red Light on its own, kind of like I did with that. And I am just going to kind of look at my very light lines that I have and just kind of fill them in a little bit. I'll probably go in with a little bit of a darker shadow color later when it's dry. I want to be careful if I'm going around another uh, flower because that's going to help shape that flower by painting negatively around it. You'll see me turn my brush sometimes and what I'm doing there is um, because the brush starts to dry out and you start to lose your point, that just helps me get that point. Kind of like if I turn a colored pencil when I'm drawing because one side goes a little flat, I can turn it and keep a nice sharp point so I don't have to sharpen. Same with the brush so I don't have to reload the brush. Sometimes I'll turn it because I can see that I got a point on one end and I'll do that so I can keep that edge. I think I want one. I want to put one more little petal in here and tuck it next to that yellow flower to help define the yellow flower. There. I didn't have everything filled in perfectly because I want to have some variance in the color. I think I will make that center petal a little bit taller though. Yeah, that's going to need a little more definition because it's so, it's such a heavy color. But that's alright. Once it dries, we can do that. Alright, we'll work on this guy here. We're going to take our ultramarine blue and our mauve and make our purple. Now we have kind of more of like that purpley color towards the center of our flower and it's more blue on the outside. So I am just kind of putting in the purple on the inside. I've got a center there that I'll mix a, a dark color for. And I'll, I'll uh, share a link to my reference photo, but keep in mind that I am I am not following it. I'm not a slave to it. I'm putting more expressive lines in. You can do whatever you want on yours, though. Negatively painting around the center right now. And then clean the brush. Grab some of the blue. We can fade it into those other colors. Into that purple from the outside, just kind of drag it in. Let it mix on the paper.
I'm not crazy about that flower. I think I'm going to, let me just crisp up the edges with some stronger color and then that can fade and that might help it a little bit. You gotta be careful because these intuitive paintings can go off the rails. At least for me, they go off the rails uh, more frequently than ones that I've planned out. That's a little better. All right, I'm gonna leave it be so I don't end up just outlining it. And I will work on the wooden uh, tabletop here a little bit. I'm going to, I think I'll start just by wetting, re-wetting that table area. Just uh, around the base, because I want to get kind of a darker weight under there. I realized that I just shot all of that off camera. What I did was wet this, and then I added in ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. I'm going to do a little, I'll add a little bit more in, uh, so you can kind of see what I did. So this is still wet. I added in the darker color, right, so I made a dark brown with those two colors and just kind of faded it out from the vase just to kind of give it a little bit more weight and presence at the bottom of the table under the vase. And then what I did was I just kind of distressed it with this tool here, which is a spatter tool. It's an Art Sherpa spatter tool. It's got really stiff plastic bristles and it's meant for flicking on paint, but you can use it to kind of gouge and scratch up the paper as well. And then you can also take your splayed apart brush or you could use a hog brush and you can um, throw in some texture that way. You could also use like an X-Acto knife and scrape back to white. There's just uh, some ways you can get some texture in your uh, wooden areas. I'm going to work on this uh, tulip in the center. I'm going to start off with some green. Just got some permanent green light here. And I'm going to drag up some center veins in these petals. We get this green, kind of strong green going up the center of the petals. They can be kind of... Um, split a little bit. You can see some of the yellow underneath. It's a very distinct tulip look. And I'm thinking I might actually want to expand the size of the tulip a little bit. I'm going to go in with a little bit of yellow with the cad red. It's the cad yellow light, same color we were using with the cad red. That was the mix that we started off with here. I'm going to make some of these tulips a little bit. Petals come out a little bit more. I'm also going to put that color for shadow. So if I have a petal, I'm going on the petal that it is underneath it and I'm dragging some of that color out. Netting it to the edges just to give it a little bit more solidity. This is just a kind of a liner. It's a number four liner, so it's a little fatter than your typical liner. Holds a lot of paint, a lot of water. This is a Princeton Neptune. It's kind of floppy though, so if you don't like floppy brushes, you might not like this, but, um, but I think it's nice. Now we're gonna go back up to that top flower, which should be dry. That's yeah, dry enough, I think. Grab some ultramarine blue. Grab some of that mauve, grab a little cad red. So we got kind of like a, uh, oh, it's almost like a purpley, a purplish red gray color. And we're gonna use that for our shadows. Gonna be very expressive. And 
I think I found where I had that word. There was a little bit of oil residue, kind of like uh, repelled the paint there a little bit, but that is fine. It wasn't anything to give it too much grief. Now I'm gonna, my brush is still dirty. I'm taking a little bit of the Cad Red, a little bit more of that yellow. So I've got kind of like a rusty brown here. And I'm gonna go in on this one down here with that number four liner and just give it some little slices of shadow. And I'm gonna clean my brush, do the same thing with an orange I made with the Cad Yellow Light that we used before and that Cad Red. There. I'm gonna leave that for right now. I'll use this nice big old Cotman brush. I bought this a long time ago. It's just such a, um, it's weird. It's not a pointed round. It's not, and it's not just that it's worn down. It's a, it's a blunt round. It's a number 14 Cotman. Um, it's such an unusual brush because usually you don't have watercolor brushes this big and I think it's just so big to balance it. It's very strange. Uh, I don't even think they make them anymore This like, like this. But I'm going to go in and put some nice big stems in my vase using the sap green now the glass will refract the reason I'm using this is because that blunt edge it gives me a great whoops great stem bottom move that up here keep going off camera on you today sorry and maybe add some ultramarine blue to the sap green and get a nice darker color that we could do some like maybe some leaves that are in the vase. Paint around these edges up there. Just get some of those colors. Now let's take some of the colors from the table some ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna and some reddish color. Let's get in there, get some of the darks in there as well. We could get some reds in there from the table. Oops, that's the wrong red. That's not what we had used, but I could take actually take it from the mixing area. Any of those shocks of color will work really well. Okay, and I'm going to do the center on that purple flower before we take a break. And I want a brush that's not too absorbent because I want to make sure that I'm not going to add a bunch of um, don't want to add a bunch of color I mean a bunch of water to it I want to just have it dark so I'm doing cad red ultramarine blue and I do want to get some of that mauve in there so really really dark purple really And I can add some detail in there. And also, I want to put some little, this is all these little um, stamens or something that's got all these little dots. I'm going to put those in there too. Okay, let's let this dry and then we'll come back for the finishing touches. And we'll zoom out so you can see everything. Okay, I took a little break, had a little lunch, um, decided to think about what I was working on here and what I wanted to do for finishing it up. And I decided I didn't want to finish it in watercolor. I really wanted to do something that was a little bit more um, mixed media. And so I'm going to use pastel. 
And I have a variety of different brands. They're all soft pastel or chalk pastel. Like I've got new pastel there. The square pastels are a little bit harder generally than the uh, than the round ones. It doesn't really matter because they're all going to be opaque and they're all going to go over your watercolor on watercolor paper really well. Um, this is a handmade pastel. It's a little softer. I just want to... I want to continue the whole like expressive method and intuitive method that I've been using. And that's what I just felt like this needed and what I wanted to do to it. So, um, so that's why I'm going with this. You don't have to do that. If you don't feel like that's what you want your piece to look like, do something different. I'm going to grab a black stick because that one is not dark enough. I often like these really um, kind of inexpensive rectangle ones really well um, for darks because you get that nice square edge you can get in there really easily and I like that. I really want this vase to be prominent so I'm adding these shadows in and the reason I'm doing the shadows first, to the darks first, is because I can crisp things up with highlights afterwards. And it's a lot easier to do it that way than to try to put my lights in first and then try to make my shadows go on top. Because a lot of times you want to blend your shadows, but your highlights you want to remain nice and bright. So that's why I'm doing it this way. Some really nice textures with pastels too. It's funny how, especially when you're intuitive painting, sometimes you're going to start off with one thing in your mind and you'll be working and you'll realize that it's going to go better if you do something else or a different media is going to work better for it or you just decide that you want to do something different. And rather than thinking that it's a failure because you didn't end up doing what you originally set out to do, give yourself that leeway to go your own way, to try something different. It's only a piece of paper. You're never going to know if you don't try. And you need to have some work like that where you can just experiment and have fun. Now obviously you wouldn't do that if it was... Like if you were painting a picture from some for somebody and they requested something very specific, now it wouldn't be the time to do that. But when you are having fun and you are painting something because you just feel um, passionate about painting it, you've got to let your creati creativity take you where it wants. Otherwise, you're probably not going to enjoy the hobby for very long. I could have used a lighter beige here, but I had that yellow already out and I knew it was close enough that I could blend it in. There, I feel like that gives it some nice weight. I like that a lot. Uh, I can try a little lighter gray. Is that going to show up? I'm going to show up a little bit right there. Okay. Always wipe your fingers off. If you're using your fingers to blend, you will probably need to clean your hands several times as you're doing this. So now I'm going to go right in with some white here on the vase. I know I don't need to really do too much because I have so much going on in there already. I'm going with some white pastel there. Some pretty strong lines there. I like to give it there. I like to get some edges. Especially if I feel like things have kind of been lost. And you've got those darks down there already so you can really just... Just take advantage of that and add your highlights and then you're going to have that look of the glass and you can go in and you can add other colors. If you want a smoother glass look you can just go and push that pastel into the tooth. Just make sure that using a clean finger if you've just been blending something else. Okay. I can't tap this off. It's too big right now. I'll have to tap it all off at the end. 
All right, that's fun. I really enjoy, I enjoy doing that. Okay, and also this edge here, we'll do this in a little bit of green. I lost that edge a little bit, so I wanted to bring it back. I'd love to get those colors, the other colors that are that are around in there. Um, I'm gonna take some buttery yellow here and add to this guy some nice creamy light color in there too. You can use pan pastels for this, it would be totally fine, look great. Some of this more orangey yellow in there. You could use colored pencil if you're working smaller. You could use acrylic paint, you can use gouache. Basically, you can use whatever you darn well please. Something I really like is capturing texture. And a great way to do that is just to put some really bold strokes in with your pastels. A lot of times flowers have this velvety uh, texture to them, and so do pastels, so it's just a really great way to, to incorporate that texture. If you use black, do that the last thing pretty much on a flower so you don't end up uh, smearing into it. You don't have to put pastel everywhere. Like there might be spots where you just need like a little bit of white. You just need to highlight things because you've got all that beautiful toning underneath and you just need to bring out the um, the details. Use the white last because it's going to overtake Just like with oil paints, white can just kind of go in there. And with watercolor too, I mean, white can, it muddies stuff up because it's so strong. <clears throat> if you had a place where you weren't happy because like maybe you had something overlapping where it shouldn't be, you had a stem overlapping a petal and you didn't like that, that is perfect to fix with pastel. And you can be more deliberate, you could be more subtle with your application, or you can be bolder. It's completely up to you. It's your painting, your rules. Doing my white last here, just kind of grabbing those edges. You do want to kind of keep an eye on your white pastel. You might need to, to uh, wipe it off in between colors because if I'm like over here and I'm adding white onto this flower and then I go over to purple, if I have any yellow, you can see that I get yellow on that pastel stick, it's going to transfer. So, um, you know, just wipe it on, wipe it on like a rag or something. And then it'll be nice and clean when you go to your next color. This here, strawberry and cream tulip that I added in needs a little bit more fresh white, but the other colors are fine. I'm not going to, I don't need to add any other colors in there because I already did. I did that with a watercolor. So just be, just be, in, you know, mindful when you do it. I think as long as you're mindful when you're adding um, mixed media to a painting, you're not going to hurt it. You're not going to ruin it. And the, and you don't have to be mindful though. If you just want to play, you just want to experiment. There is nothing wrong with that. That's how you learn. You may not get the results that you're going for that first time, but you will, you will learn. And it's one of those things where like you can watch all the YouTube videos you want, but until you've actually put brush to paper, until you've actually tried, you're not really going to 
you're not really going to know. You're not going to really know how something's going to work until you've, you know, you've tried it, until you've felt the materials in your hands, you've seen what they've done with the paper, you've worked yourself out of, you know, you've gotten yourself out of a corner that you've backed yourself into. You don't know until you've done it. And you're always going to be learning, and you're always going to be finding, you know, challenges and problems to solve, and I think that's why art is so good for us. It can constantly challenges us, and it constantly makes us, um, makes us get better. It forces our minds to be kind of plastic and, and, uh, malleable and open. I was never happy with this flower up here. I'm glad I get a second chance. I'm glad I get a do-over. That's what you kind of get when you do mixed media. You get a little bit of a a do-over for some of these. Ooh, some of this would look pretty in here. Okay, so I said, you know, do your white last, but try not to, I, I should say, try not to go over your white unless you're trying to blend it. Because you, I mean, you can go in, obviously, with more colors, but if you start mixing in with a white, that's when you start to get, get some mud. Let's see, we want to, I think we want a little red in our base as well. Make the greens really, really pop. Get some of those darker refractions in there too, it's nice. Okay, so now I'm going to tip this up a little bit and have a look and see what I think and tap off it. Any dust. And, oops, you know what I see? That right there. I don't want that. That's a little too smack dab in the middle of the plan. That little black speck, so I want to integrate that a little bit. Not disturbing my white. Pastels are so forgiving. I also have a pastel course. If you've ever wanted to try pastels, it's a wonderful introductory course. And we'll be able to take our tape off in just a second and see what we have. Alright, let's do this. Let's take our tape off and see what our painting looks like. Now for signing this, you could sign this in either watercolor or pastel. Just use a medium that you've used. I think pastel pencil, because it's also pastel. That would probably be the easiest way to sign it, especially if you're going over an area with pastel. Oh, I love to see the white border. I just something so finished about it when you have that white border, I think. I really like this. I wasn't sure how it was going to come out. I wasn't sure how I liked it the way I was approaching it, but you know, I uh, I like this. Let's just bring that up here. You can see it a little closer. It's kind of fun. I think it's kind of fun. You can let me know what you think in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this. If so, please give me a thumbs up before you go. And uh, keep in mind, your painting is your painting. You can do whatever you want to it. The only person you need to please with your art is yourself. So make sure you do that. If you don't do anything else, make sure you do that. Thanks for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.